Welcome to this uh, Data Jam event. So this is the seventh in a series of Data Jam events that we've been running uh, during, during COVID. I hope we're coming to the end of this series and soon we'll be back to face-to-face -to -face meetings or at least hybrid meetings. Uh, this particular event is on the topic of uh, digital exclusion. Um, my name is Steve Coggy. I'm your host for the day. I'm the director of the National Innovation Center for Data and I'll take you to the, the event today. Just to show you the, the organizations who are going to be presenting today, uh, thank you to, to all of them. I'm going to introduce the speaker shortly. So we're, um, I'll start out by telling you a little bit about the three organizations that are sponsoring this event. That's the National Innovation Center for Data, Data Jam, and the Analyst Network Northeast. And then we'll move into this uh, series of speed talks. So everybody gets 10 minutes. Um, at the end of the speed talks, uh, we'll move into a Q&A session, which I'll chair. So if you have any comments or questions during the speed talks, please put them into the chat. We very rarely have time between each talk for, for, for questions because it's a very tight schedule, but we'll try to get around to them all at the end. Okay, so let me move on to talking about the three um, organizations that are sponsoring. Data Jam is all about bringing um, a bunch of people from across government and the third sector and the private sector together to talk about how we can use data and service design to solve real problems that are affecting real people in our region, the North East. It's really great to hear product people and service people talk about data. So we're bringing together people to have the right types of conversations and this event really fills a need in itself and hopefully we'll get the same sort of outcomes that we did from the last one. Data and service design are integral parts of the puzzle really to making good services. If you don't have the data, you don't know whether or not you're impacting change or whether your service is successful or not. Uh, there's a lot of passion and a lot of enthusiasm and bringing those ideas and that knowledge together in one place is really exciting. Data Jam's been awesome fun. Um, we've met lots of different people. It's really interesting to hear how different people are using data how they do their analysis, so it's really helpful for the observatory. I've attended the on-conference sessions, I've attended ARC sessions and um, it's been amazing. We've been working on um, skills for young people and how they can map it with location. The team needed a Power BI developer, um, it was good to like put my skills into good use. It's a wonderful opportunity to have everybody here from so many different places working on so many different problems and taking it forward means that it it's not just a couple of days away from the office, it's actually changing how people work and it's getting people to think about things in a slightly different way. It's helped us think about some of the use of some of the sensors that we already have, how we can use them to help achieve some of the outcomes that the people have been talking about in the room. I'm really excited about that because it's a whole different slant on the city that we currently don't have. It's amazing how um, people can come together for for common good, irrespective of their um, job description. And it's something I'm going to take out from here and I'm going to run with it forever. We've had the same energy, I think, that we had at the last year, which is really great. We've kept that, kept that momentum going. And I think one of the things that we're saying is that Data Jam's a community, it's not an event. The work that we've taken and the foundations that we've put in place from the hacks are definitely things that we're going to be able to take forward. DWP can't solve all of the different problems that our users have on our own by working closely with all of the partner organisations that we deal with is the only way we are really going to get to the right outcomes for our users. Data Jam will help us do that. So just to, another word on Data Jam just before finish. So um, it is, as uh, Salim was saying there, it is a community. We're about 500 strong. And not everybody turns up to every event, obviously, but uh, we, it's a very active community. Pre-COVID, we did lots of face-to-face -face meetings. We worked on lots of projects together. At the moment, we feel we're, 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 we're just keeping things going by running these regular events and keeping the community active. Hopefully, it won't be too long until we can start planning the next real uh, Data Jam conference with a bit of luck towards the end of the year. But uh, keep, keep your ears tuned and we'll, we'll, we'll keep you informed. Um, okay, so um, the other uh, second of the organizations that is involved is the Analyst uh, Network Northeast, which is as a regional um, branch of the Operational Research Society. Um, and this tends to be a data professionals, mostly working in the public sector, who get together to discuss best practice, um, have interesting discussions about uh, the approaches that they're taking, methodologies, and so on. Um, 
all the, all the, all the details are there on the slide. And then the third organization is the National Innovation Center for Data. And we'll just run you a quick two minute video to give you a sense of what the National Innovation Center for, for Data does for organizations in the Northeast and the UK. The global economy is undergoing a data-driven revolution. Public and private sector organizations that can interpret data can use the insights to vastly improve the way they operate. The National Innovation Center for Data, or NICD for short, has been established to enable all organizations to improve their data capabilities and expertise so that they can solve problems and seize new opportunities. Created with funding from the UK government and Newcastle University, NICD is very different to a data consultancy. Our role is to strengthen the UK economy by transferring data skills to organisations of all sizes, from small and medium-sized enterprises to huge corporates and public sector bodies like the NHS, so that we can address the UK shortage of data skills. Our data science experts will work with your team, supporting your project. We'll take the journey with them, navigate and help steer them towards the best solution, whilst introducing them to new data skills and techniques. We'll help them deliver an immediate return on your project by working to improve your productivity, increase your efficiency, or develop new and innovative products and services. And your team will learn how to apply what they've learned to future projects. Of course, learning doesn't stop when the project ends. You become part of the NICD ecosystem, connected to like-minded people and organizations. You can stay in touch and benefit from the shared knowledge and access to our talent pipeline of data science graduates. So the next time a data challenge or opportunity arises, your people will have the skills and the support network to manage, analyze, and interpret data so that your organization can flourish. So, okay, so if you want to follow up on any of those, National Research Center for Data, Data Jam, or the Analyst Network Northeast, just, just follow up with some of the organizers of the event. We'll put you in touch with the right people to have a conversation. Okay, let's just move into our speed talks. Each talker gets 10 minutes in turn. Um, there may be some time for questions, but I doubt it in between the sweet talks. Okay, let me, let's turn to our first speaker now. I'm gonna ask the speakers to sort of introduce themselves and their organization in turn. So I'll start out with um, Adam Parnaby. Adam, are you there? Hello. Hi, Adam, right over to you. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Adam Parnaby. Uh, I am a uh, research assistant at NTCA, and uh, when I'm not a research assistant at NTCA, I'm a PhD student at Open Lab, uh, Newcastle University. And uh, today I'm going to be giving a very whistle-stop rundown of uh, some of the complexities around uh, digital inclusion, particularly some of the social complexities and what implications those have for how we think about data when it comes to digital exclusion and in particular how we design uh, effective uh, digital inclusion interventions. Um, so to start with, we should probably define our terms a little bit. So what exactly is digital exclusion? Um, this has historically frequently been considered primarily as a uh, technical or an infrastructural problem. Uh, we think about issues like who has uh, broadband, where are the cables run, where are the cellular data towers, who is in data poverty, who has access to smartphones, etc. And that is, of course, uh, crucial. That's very important. But there are additional layers, if you like, on top of that. Uh, just because somebody has what I'm calling for our purposes material access to a device and to connectivity doesn't necessarily mean that they can actually derive benefit from digital opportunities. So we need to think about issues like accessibility and how we design our services. We need to think about uh, accessible user interfaces. We need to think about accessible ways of talking about uh, digital issues. Um, we also need to think about digital skills. Um, I could do this entire talk 10 times over just on digital skills. Um, I'm not going to, but in short, uh, digital skills is, to my mind, becoming something of an unhelpfully broad term. We could be talking about anything from finding the power button on a laptop to recognizing that the YouTube algorithm is accidentally radicalizing you. And those are obviously quite different things that require quite different approaches if we're talking about intervention and service design. Um, we also need to think about uh, social access. And this is where we start getting into some uh, quite interesting ethical and political questions. Uh, things like who has access to support from friends and family when they're struggling to access something? Where does that support come from? Who is obligated to provide that support? Who funds that support? Um, who has the confidence to 
uh, access things, who believes that they can access things. Uh, those of you who are technically minded in the room, I'm sure will know that a lot of that technical mindedness came from having the confidence to experiment and to make mistakes, which is something that not everyone has the luxury of for various complex social and societal reasons. Um, we can also think about uh, access to opportunity. Who is in the room when we are making decisions about uh, who, uh, about how these platforms that are increasingly controlling our lives, these digital platforms, how they work? Who is in those rooms? And that kind of brings me to the crux of my uh, argument here today, which I recognize is a slightly provocative argument. Um, but in the sake of, uh, for the sake of sort of generating discussion, uh, who is in those rooms? Uh, things are getting better, but currently, mostly, uh, those uh, decisions are primarily made by people who are white, people who are male, people who are well-educated, people that look an awful lot like this. Um, and that then ties digital exclusion into social exclusion, into social justice. Um, and so what is the link there? My argument is that they are basically the same thing. Digital exclusion is a form of social exclusion. Um, if we can separate them at all, which is something that uh, I would question, then they certainly reinforce one another. Um, social exclusion uh, means that people have less access to resources, uh, less access to education, less access to the things that would equip them to take advantage of digital opportunities to better their position. Uh, and as a result, you get this positive feedback effect, the rich get richer, people who are digitally excluded stay digitally excluded and stay socially excluded. And so therefore, uh, there is, uh, I would argue, an impetus for uh, public bodies to intervene in these situations. Um, but designing effective and designing responsive digital inclusion interventions requires high quality data. So in terms of data, what do we have? Well, in the UK, we are uh, relatively fortunate in that we have access to some fairly robust national level data on uh, broad internet usage. So whether someone is an internet user or not, on certain kinds of internet usage, whether people use emails, whether people can perform certain digital skills uh, from a variety of sources that I've listed uh, some of there. Um, we also have a lot of um, what I'm calling uh, demographic informa information, kind of predictive information from a variety of studies around what the main risk factors for digital exclusion are. So that's age, education, disability, rurality are really the big four in the UK at the moment. Uh, these things do change over time. And I also want to point out that education there immediately links us straight into poverty, which immediately links us into ethnicity, into gender, into everything that you could possibly think of. So um, it's not uh, simple necessarily to predict, but we do have a lot of studies that can indicate to us, given the demography of an area, how at risk of digital exclusion is it likely to be? Uh, we also have a huge variety of digital skills surveys. Uh, I really want to emphasize the word variety there. Um, we have lots of surveys done by individual organizations in their communities for particular purposes on skills, on access, on what people have and don't have. These things aren't necessarily always uh, methodologically similar. They're not necessarily directly comparable, but there are, they do exist and there are a lot of them, especially at the moment as a result of the pandemic. Um, we also have a huge amount of qualitative insight, especially in the VCSE sector, um, around what kinds of interventions work, what kinds of interventions are needed, what the priorities are. Uh, but a lot of this intelligence is quite uh, disparate, it's quite spread out, it's difficult to collate, it's difficult to compare, um, and especially uh, it's difficult to put together at kind of a regional level. We have a very uh, broad scale of uh, national level information. We know, for example, that the Northeast tends to be more digitally excluded than the Southeast. Um, but at a municipal level, at the kind of level that uh, people like uh, NTCA, for example, are making decisions, um, things like uh, if there is a pandemic and people need devices, how many devices do we buy? How many devices do we distribute? Where do they need to go? What should the targets be? What are the priorities? What can we expect the impact to be? Those kinds of questions at that kind of more granular local level are much harder to deal with. We know that rural Northumberland, because of the demography, because of the rurality, is more likely to be an at-risk area than central Newcastle. But we don't know by how much. We don't know how that turns into an intervention, basically. Um, we also find it very hard to make robust longitudinal comparisons because the kinds of questions that we're asking keep changing. Uh, nobody cared about Zoom five years ago, but now it has become arguably one of the most important technologies to our civilization. Um, 
We also, and this is the one that really keeps me up at night, we don't necessarily have a clear idea of what we're trying to achieve with digital inclusion. What does a digitally included person look like? What does an equitable digital society look like? These are questions that don't necessarily get interrogated as much as certainly I would like. Um, is it, uh, wh where do we draw a hypothetical digital poverty line is, is an unanswered question really. Um, and there are, there are different opinions on that. There is different work on that, but um, it's not uh, necessarily something that's easy to agree upon. And there are lots of ethical questions there. Um, and really the, the crux of this uh, is that uh, digital inclusion and by extension, digital exclusion are highly context dependent and they're always changing. So the digital inclusion needs of say a long-term unemployed person living in an urban area are gonna be fundamentally different from the digital inclusion needs of a relatively wealthy, retired, socially isolated person in a rural area. Those are both clearly digital exclusion of a kind. Uh, there's a need for digital inclusion of a kind, but the approaches are fundamentally different. And the data that we have at the moment doesn't really capture that. A lot of the data that we have at the moment can't really distinguish between an internet user who checks Facebook once a month and an internet user who is a software lead at Google. Um, and also the goalposts are always moving. Uh, the pandemic example with Zoom is quite a dramatic example, obviously, but what the relevant skills are, what the relevant things that people need to do are, are constantly moving and they're constantly uh, changing relative to what other people are able to do. Um, these are very complex questions that we don't necessarily have the data to explore at a more granular level in a way that allows us to make these kinds of longitudinal comparisons, to see what the impact actually is, what the change actually is in a meaningful way. Um, so what can we here do about this? Uh, first of all, we can do this, we can talk, um, we can think about what an inclusive digital society could, should look like, we can pool resources. Uh, if you have answers to any of the thorny problems that I've been uh, that I've been talking about today, please, for the love of God, get in touch with me, I would love to talk to you. Um, we can also think about ways that we can collect data that's more uh, longitudinal. We can think about people's behaviors when exposed to a new technology, as opposed to uh, how do they respond to technology A or technology B? Rather than uh, can they use Microsoft Office, how do they respond to an unfamiliar piece of technology or how do people react to a software update? Um, and finally, and this is a personal plea, uh, we cannot pretend that this is all going to go away when the pandemic is over. Uh, the first person in the UK to promise universal broadband access was Tony Blair in his first term in office. Um, this is a problem that has been around for as long as digital has been around and it's not going away anytime soon. Uh, we can't pretend that it's going to be solved when people are back in the office and back in schools. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much, Adam. And, and thank you for being so impressively on time. Very good. And also, can I repeat what Adam was saying in terms of a plea? If anybody out there has data or any ideas or wants to have a conversation with Adam or any of the other speakers, please do follow up directly or through us. Okay, thank you very much, Adam. Uh, next speaker is uh, Mark Martin, MBE. Over to you, Mark. Thank you for having me and good afternoon all. So let me just quickly get my screen up. So when we think about computer science, we're thinking about does it work for all? And I love the, uh, oops, let's back that. I love the previous speaker in the sense that who is computer science for? And does it work for all of our young people? And this presentation is just going to cover some of the, the insights that I've, I've had as a computer science teacher for the last 15 years, working in secondary school, and then seeing emerging gaps with these big tech companies moving in, asking for data science, asking for all of these different skills. But when we think about who is computer science for, we can be here forever discussing whose perception who's created a narrative, and as who does it actually work for. And we want our computer science curriculum to be the most diverse in the world. I think that's one thing that we can champion across the UK. And we want to ensure that computer science is for all students. And, you know, here's a, here's a thought to think about. The fight against equality is like the fight against climate change. Every action, thought, belief, action or process from individual or institution will help to enhance or harm others. And I'm going to explore more about how this, this thing harm or, or, or kind of have a threat on the whole kind of ecosystem that we're trying to build. But we know what the opportunities are. We've got thousands of reports to show you how if, if, if computer science works for us all, we have better brands, productivity, 
creativity, services, innovation, and so forth. But there's an elephant in the room, and we've probably heard about it in the news. It's in our news. It's the big R. It's the hidden R. It's around how do we kind of uh, perceive others that don't look or smell or sound like us. And what I decided to do is to look at what are the inequalities in computer science and looking at uh, black students in computer science and how does um, does anyone know what's happened in the last probably uh, 10 years of black students in computer science compared to other groups. And what we found is that uh, when there was a, a change over in 2014 from um, computer science to, uh, no, sorry, from ICT to computer science, there was a 50% dropout rate between black students participating in computer science. Now, we, we kind of done a knee-jerk reaction when we saw that was the case for uh, gender in terms of girls going from ICT into computer science, but no one even batted the eyelid when this happened in terms of when they were looking at ethnicity. Now, again, the take up for GCSEs has increased in all ethnic groups. The subject proven popular amongst Chinese and Asian students, but black students are still the most underrepresented group in taking CS. But who knows, did you know that this was the case? And then when we look at the actual stats in terms of what subjects the black students are taking, heavily to do with psychology, drama, French, but below um, in terms of population and also representation, we, we are very few when it comes to uh, GCSE and the same thing for A-levels. Now, here's a few questions that comes to my mind. How many are in the profession? Do we have a voice? Are we trying, uh, uh, sorry, there's a slight grammar here, our best to promote them? Are we trying our best to retain them? Are they represented in the curriculum design? Are we leaving, why are they leaving the profession and do they exist, but do they know or do we acknowledge them? And then when we think about the population of London, you know, where I'm based, at this current time, it's 45% uh, black and ethnic uh, minority population. In one university, they've got over 50% Bain population, but only 5% enter a technical sector. And then when we think about once our best students that come from a black and African and Caribbean background, 16% of them are unemployed. So these are the ones that are leaving with the first and the seconds and the and, you know, these are the ones that are our role models, so to say, that have made it through uh, graduation, but still face unemployment. And then when we look at, you know, how many of them sit on British boards, and so there's no British born black or ethnic minority in senior leadership in top tech companies across the UK. So hopefully I've painted a, a great context and a great picture for some of the consequences that we're now going to see in the sense of, um, our technology. So when we look at our technology in terms of facial recognition to um, the data that is um, showcasing uh, that, you know, if you've got African or an Asian sounding name, you're going to pay higher car insurance all the way through to, you know, uh, passport scanning systems. And then here's the 360 to the story. A young 14 year old black schoolboy was walking uh, from uh, home and he was fingerprinted after being misidentified by a facial recognition. What data sets were they using? How did they come to that, uh, uh, that, that conclusion? Now here's the scariest thing that I think about in, in computer science and when we think about data. The people that visioned the world 50 years ago, now it's a reality. And in that reality, there are things that are being excluded from that. And I think that in order to, you know, make computer science work for us all, what is the real, what is the collective reality that we want to see going forward? Because if we do not act now, we're going to see more of the consequences of, you know, thinking that we're doing right when it comes to looking at computer science and data, but actually we do more harm and exclude the people that we're trying to serve. So when we think about equality, ensuring that computer science is for all, it's beyond the kind gestures and providing the same opportunities for all communities to thrive in computer science. Also acknowledging that excluding groups from computer science leads to harming and undermining efforts in future 
for future for fairer future in technology. So I'm not going to. I will talk about culturally responsive curriculums, how we can do that in the academia world. But let's talk about some of the solutions. So one of the things that we decided to do from a UK black test. UK black text perspective is launch a platform to show black innovators, people that are doing amazing work. It was surprising that it wasn't the fact that they didn't exist. It's the fact that they're like submarines. They only pop out probably black history month because that's when they've got the platform to shine. But actually do they shine in areas of our uh, workplace? And one of the, the things that we've seen with perception is that sometimes perceptions can come reality. And for us, we know that in our society, what's going to make our data science and our computer systems be one of the best in the world? It's about how do we involve all different types of talent from different types of backgrounds. And then my team, we've got a collective of us that work across the whole industry, um, people in uh, some senior jobs and, and, and so forth. And what we try and do, we try and advocate to, you know, showcase the innovators do partnership with big companies so we've done this uh, partnership with pwc to travel around the uk to work with organizations and then some of the highlights um, we've done an innovation showcase we've done hackathons looking at um, diseases uh, we've worked with schools universities and it's not so much about um uh you know just increasing the diversity it's actually how do how are how are the black innovators seen? How are the black technologists seen? How are the black data scientists seen? And that's a real kind of key for us in the sense that our perception sometimes limits where we feel that they can go. So what we've done is that we've gone to universities and done mock technical interviews um, with, with companies and with university students. We've left their programming courses. So that's a different narrative in sense of just going in there just to talk about role modeling but actually seeing us in uh, situations where we are helping uh, the wider school population to see black technologists and data scientists as intellects and professionals. And we've traveled around the UK, we've done some work in Newcastle, trying to support some of their final year degree students and entrepreneurs to think about staying in Newcastle, not having to think that London is the mecca for tech. And then we've done some awesome work with Bradford Hull and Coventry in terms of support. So in just a nutshell, we've, we, what we feel as UK Black Tech is that the more we're integrated into this ecosystem, the more impact that we can see. So we've helped Institute of Code, uh, Leeds University in Future Learn release courses. We've just done an innovation map to, lo to, to locate who's doing what across the country in terms of innovation and creativity. Um, we, we're working on this fantastic report at the moment, looking at smart cities and connected communities. And we're looking at it from three different lenses, architecture, technology and communities. It's not a diversity piece. It's finally a piece where black folks get to showcase their skills and the things that they're good at rather than just talking about diversity and inclusion. And then, you know, some of the impact we've made within this space in terms of working with institutions across the UK and so forth. And Last but not least, if you want to kind of follow us or join our journey, we're on Discord. We do lots of build a community to showcase the different talents and expertise across the country. So thank you. I know I've rushed through a lot in a, a very short space of time, but what I wanted to show you that some there here, here is a great opportunity to show real um, uh, inclusion and how we solve this this gap that is here at this current time. Right, thank you so much, Mark. Um, and we've invited Mark up uh, next month on the 6th, Mark, is it? You're coming up to see us? Yeah, that's So correct. Mark's coming up on the 6th. So if anybody else would like to meet up with Mark, we'll maybe arrange a little event. If anybody else in the community would like to join us, you'll be more than welcome. So thank you very much, Mark. Thank you, okay. Steve. Next speaker, our next speaker is Ben Carpenter. Ben, are you there? Um, so thanks, I will take, uh, I've got about 50 slides, so I'll start rattling through them. My name is Ben, I work for CDDO in the Cabinet Office. Till recently, the, the CDDO was sort of joined up to GDS and we've split off as siblings. You may have heard of GDS, Government Digital Service. I'm a service designer. Uh, I just renamed the talk, um, trying to do inclusive inclusion, not exclusive inclusion. Um, so I have a slightly different maybe angle on on this work, uh, uh, having worked in the area for a long while and um, seen a number of things 
uh, within government design. So I'm coming specifically with the sort of angle of designing government public services. Um, so to rattle through, why does exclusion matter and how does it get designed? Because it doesn't just, it's usually a choice. It may be unconscious, but it's usually a choice. So in terms of government, um, it matters because uh, we're not a shop. We're not, we don't, we can't pick some customers and sort of exclude others. We can't say, tell you what, we're just gonna um, sell things online like Amazon do. Uh, we, if we were the equivalent of Amazon, we'd have bookshops everywhere and uh, call centers that you could turn up and order your books by and people helping you to get to the bookshop and all that stuff. So one of the reasons I don't like comparisons when you hear people in government saying, oh, we should be, we should be like Uber, or we should be like Google, or we should be like Amazon. Well, they're not multi-channel, um, all customer uh, ex exclusion, not allowed uh, organizations, we are. So in government, um, to be effective, you have to be inclusive because we're here to serve everybody uh, with the services they need. In theory, inclusion in that sense, um, in terms of public service delivery, should mean that people are experiencing fewer problems uh, and that they're therefore having to have fewer interactions, which is cheaper for the government and, and for them. They'll be having more success with using those public services, which means more time and money for them and for us and a better experience for, for everyone or for, for them. So we did some research in my former team on uh, what it takes to go out and actually build fully inclusive services and essentially found two sort of flagship things. First is big scope. And by that, I mean, um, you, have to, you have to be thinking at the scale of users' lives. In terms of digital exclusion, that's, that's, um, that's more obvious if we're talking about including people to be able to use something that's online. Then you, you may be talking about access to uh, digital technology and um, you know, skills, training, support, that kind of thing. But uh, in terms of a whole public service where you might be including offices and call centers, you, you have to you have to literally put put the thing you want people to use within reach. It's the primary challenge of inclusivity uh, is you have to actually be able to access the thing. In public services, this means whole services that are built for end-to-end -end journeys, by which we mean the whole of what a, a, a citizen might need from the beginning when they're trying to fix something, sort some, some problem right through to the point that it's been fixed or they've had their answer. So that means not just online transactions. It means whatever interactions, devices, channels, and organizations necessary, you have to smudge all that together, design it well, design it in a joined up way. And uh, that, that's, that's, the, that's what we mean by big scope. So that's the first sort of requirement of, um, of inclusivity. Uh, so this, this extremely happy person on their very posh MacBook is not, that is not a digital service example. This is a digital service. So when we talk about digital exclusion again um, and exclusion within public services. And one of my mantras is to remind government that when we say digital service, we don't mean online service necessarily. We mean uh, many things from somebody on the phone, uh, somebody reading bits of paper on a pin board, somebody trying to catch a bus to get to an appointment, face-to-face -face conversation. Yes, a service on it. So within my field of work, we set and try and uphold uh, standards for the whole of government to meet around designing public services, uh, of which uh, the name on it for us is a service standard. And we've got it there as point to solve the whole problem for users at the bottom of the screen. There are, there are a load more points off the screen, by the way, it's not just two points in the standard. Um, so yeah, solve the whole problem. And within the detail of that, that's what we're asking um, service teams across government to do. So the second part, and this is more to the point of what I'm talking to you about today, is, is to a requirement for building inclusive public services that people need to be able to understand all the types of exclusion that are out there. Um, so this might seem contentious given the topic of today's... Uh, people do tend to focus on certain types of inclusion and exclusion. And we found this within government uh, public sort of service design worlds. Um, for, and for example, some of the easier ones to understand and, and focus on are uh, around disability. So um, uh, web accessibility, we have, the, we have laws and clear guidance on making websites accessible for people with disabilities and impairments, but also assisted digital, which is government speak, policy speak for helping somebody to do something online that they otherwise couldn't do themselves. So I've included stock patronizing image of little old man being helped by kind, young, digitally savvy person here. Sorry if it's somebody on the call, this is one of your posters, maybe. Um, but yeah, so those, those, those are two examples that we found it was really, really much easier for people in government to go, right, we want to be inclusive, 
what do we need to do? Okay, there's accessibility. Oh, and then there's this uh, assisted digital thing to help people who aren't online. Now we're inclusive. Right, that's that's great, and those things are really really important. But we found that by over focusing on those types of inclusion, it actually led to more exclusion because they weren't open minded to other types. But also uh, capturing and thinking about all the types of exclusion somebody might experience is really hard. So the piece of work we undertook was to review is an obligatory post-it note, uh, post note picture, uh, was to review, capture and review all the reasons we could find with service failure, where users were struggling to do something when, when competing a, a, government, a government service, and to group them into sort of common themes that would apply to anybody. And we've come up with this list, and it's just a list, universal barriers. So it summarizes all the barriers that a user may experience, and we call it universal because they apply to all users in all situations and are relevant all of the time to some extent. So this includes me trying to get onto this Zoom call and share my slides with you. It includes me uh, getting into the room. It includes me opening the tin of beans I had for lunch, all that sort of thing. So these barriers can, can apply at all times. Um, they do apply at all times. Uh, there will always be barriers. It's important to know as designers that there's not an expectation to perfect things but the but if we're going to try and reduce all types of exclusion for all reasons then we should have a full view of, of what those reasons are and that's what this list attempts to capture um the aim of this is to help designer builders within government to to have that big scope and avoid that exclusive inclusion we've been talking about so again all people share the same areas of finite capacity um and, and barriers arise if, if you're asked to do something that exceeds your capacity. So here's the 11 things that we came up with, uh, awareness, time. In fact, I'll run through them in a bit more detail now. Well, I've run over time. Um, so awareness, you have to know the thing exists. Whatever it is, if you don't know it's there, you can't get to it. The most exclusive thing would be to not be using something because you didn't even know it existed. You need time to use the thing, but also to get to the thing, to wait for a response to all sorts of stuff. Finance is a big factor, not just to maybe pay for a premium rate phone call, but to catch the bus. But using a printer, you have to buy a printer, you have to travel to a printer, is paper and ink, all the costs. And what about the risks of actually using a service, fines if you get it wrong, or if you're, the thing you want to do it with government is start a business, what are the risks of evading business or failed uh, planning permission, for example? Access, so not just access to a screen, but access to a person or a photo booth or, again, a printer. Interface skills, so beyond just digital interfaces and digital devices, but writing, uh, talking, reading, um, do, do, we, do people have uh, the, the capacity to do those things we often. Self-confidence underpins a lot of these things we found and uh, often it's just people don't believe that they'll be able to complete tasks. Uh, comprehension, again, not just of content written on screens, but of, um, of signage at venues or things being spoken to you over the phone. Your emotional state, highly connected. These are all interconnect massively, but emotional state, one day I'll feel fine uh, using a quite a complex public person, and then um, you know the next day with uh, with with some you know if life gets in the way you may not really feel up to it. So these are very important. Trust not only in the technology and the stuff you're using, but the people who are behind it and what they're going to do with your data and information. Evidence most public services require you to provide some data to provide some information. Lots of them provide require you to churn up a bit of paper and uh, that's something that some people have more capacity for than others and enthusiasm the last one enthusiasm just might not want to do it might not be bothered might put it off for months and months and months whatever it is so these are the 11 sort of variables but it is just a list and it needs tools so just to finish here are some examples of uses of the the list of barriers from across government at the moment that we've seen um within the sort of cross government community that i'm trying i, I curate and uh, organize um, we've got a team here at gov.uk verify who did an audit of their audit of the inclusivity of what they were doing by comparing all their uh, what they were finding across the 11 barriers and looking for gaps in their research recruitment. Um, HMRC colleagues uh, have created a game, a card game almost to play to raise awareness of the exclusion under these all these different areas and try and open up uh, thinking. And um, other teams who want to remain um, using the barriers to, to inform the research priorities and who they should, could recruit and research with. Uh, interrelation of barriers uh, across services as well. People looking at a connection between, you know, they, they can all connect to each other. You can quite easily imagine how um, comprehension and time might go together quite well because, you know, if you've got a limited time to read an awful lot of and understand an awful lot of material, then. Uh, that's less easy and more of a barrier, more likely to exclude. Measure, um, 
measurement going on here to see which barriers are at play and which ones are coming down with interventions over time. Uh, and also joining up with other models of inclusion, which we know about because there are many, uh, but a COMB model around uh, capability, opportunity, motivation and behaviour is a kind of similarly structured thing that's reasonably well known in HMRC and has been, has been sort of tying it to that. Uh, so that really was a, a rattle through just an introduction really, um, yeah, hopefully thank useful. You. Thank, you very, thank you very much, Ben. You, you scared the words out of me when you told me you had 50 slides to get through, but actually you were only one minute over time. You did well. And um, it may well be that Ben will invite you back for some of the Data Jam events because there's a broad interest in service design across you know, Data Jam. I think you've got a lot of interesting stuff to say there. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, let me hand now over to, to Lynn Corner. Hi, Lynn. Hi everyone. Hi. Um, so uh, lovely to be here. Thanks, Steve, for the invitation. So my name is um, Lynn Corner. Um, I am the director of Voice, um, which is a large citizen network um, based at uh, the other organisations in the Catholic Building National Innovation Centre for Aging. Um, so going to talk a little bit today about some of the issues for older people and um, um, and digital exclusion. Just a quick word on voice as we start. Um, voice is an international network of citizens, a national network of citizens. We uh, are right across the UK, a chapter in the UK, um, the US uh, building China, Singapore. So, you know, digital connectivity is really important to us because uh, we use a digital platform associated mobile phone apps to really give kind of some global reach to a conversation with citizens about the issues that are important to them. Um, and in terms of um, really sort of looking at, um, you know, what are their stories? What is what is important? What are their priorities? Um, what are their um, their, their ideas? Um, so actually, this issue of digital exclusion is massively important to us. And because we work closely with a range of voluntary and community sector organisations, with other higher education organisations, um, very, very important for us to understand, um, you know, th this issue of um, how are we reaching the people most greatly in need um, as we as we build this kind of global ecosystem? You know, how do we make sure that the, the products and services that are being developed to help us all with healthy longevity um, are actually, um, you know, um, people have got the ability to kind of connect so this issue of kind of democratizing healthy longevity making sure that people are connected uh, making sure that people um, have the opportunity to understand all of what is possible in terms of healthy longevity it is really really important so yeah so that was just a little bit of um of, of context and obviously this issue of um of healthy longevity is is hugely important why i think you know there are two global challenges um net zero sustainability and healthy longevity everything else is how we address it um for thriving planet place and and people and it's massive two billion people over 60 uh, by 2030 changing every aspect of society and so if we are to achieve healthy longevity in the uk and internationally we have to address um in inequalities and that includes digital inequalities because I think what COVID has exposed is the fault lines um, you know that were already there it's accelerated those trends um, so actually you know we, we have work to do um, collectively in terms of um, broader inequalities and I agree with Adam that digital inequality is just one of those and it's really um, you know again agreeing with Adam it's a human right that all citizens regardless of geography or circumstances have an opportunity to benefit from from this incredible extension in life expectancy to live healthier, longer, better lives. And so the granular data that we need um, in terms of helping us to understand what are the issues and indeed what are the solutions is, is absolutely critical. As a, as a final kind of point of introduction really to the to the issues, I think as well, it is really important that we don't group all older people together and that with this granular difference and um, that age is just simply a number is really, really important because obviously the over 50s spanning 40, 50 years clearly the most diverse group imaginable. And yes, inequalities early in life continue across the life course into later life. So there are massive differences in um, financial um, circumstances, in education, in work, in skills, in aspirations, in capabilities, and indeed in, in vulnerabilities. And so, um, you know, th these are reinforced by very unhelpful stereotypes and myths about older people not being tech savvy or digitally included when actually the vast majority are. And there is vast data to interrogate and interpret to it to account for this. 
But yes, we know that those inequalities gaps are rising and you know, digital connectedness has been quite rightly the, perhaps a key issue in terms of COVID, um, the ability to be online, to um, be able to pay for data, to have access to online shopping, medical services, job opportunities, and so on and so forth. Um, and so much more, it, it just absolutely matters. And obviously if you're not connected, um, if you don't have the kit first and foremost, um, people, people miss out and it, it especially has deeper implications for already vulnerable people. So really, really important to kind of understand it at quite a granular level. But I think in terms of, um, you know, th thinking through um, both the opportunities, it, it, it is really important as well, it's been touched upon today, that we, we look at the intelligence that we have available to us. Um, but then we also really, really motor on this issue of ethics and data, because we've only scratched the surface on crucial issues for digital exclusion. Um, issues such as the, you know, they've been touched upon in terms of accountability, in terms of fairness, in terms of user data rights, who is selling data to whom and our knowledge of this, our knowledge and ability to opt in and out, make informed choices, I think is really, really important. And, you know, that has really been, um, you know, the spotlights on it in terms of NHS data currently um, with, with the, you know, the vaccine programme and the current initiative to, to try and sort of harness GP data. Um, but it is, it, it is really a digital divide even in voice amongst our members who tend to be quite well informed and digitally connected, there was almost zero knowledge that this was happening. And, you know, how acceptable is that? How de democratic is that? I think is a, a real issue going forward. It goes way beyond just having the kit and the connectivity. This issue of intelligence, ethics and democracy, I think is the, 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 the next big challenge for us. A profound concentration of power, I think, between relatively few hands and few companies. Um, and there's already a trend about how this can be exacerbated. And this is really important because those that data that's been collected through social media, through other means in early life, then has implications for how it's used in later life. And this is why it's a healthy longevity issue. So it really does matter in terms of um, who, uh, how that knowledge is used in terms of our individual um, experience and our collective and future healthy um, selves. So I think that kind of whole area of healthy longevity, um, the ethics around it, the aging intelligence is, is uh, you know, the key issue of, of our time really, going way beyond traditional digital exclusion. But in terms of some positives at the National Innovation Centre for Aging, as I said, in terms of being a data driven organisation, we are um, also looking at how data can be used um, and how it can actually strengthen um, um, and address issues such as loneliness and isolation. So, for example, during COVID, uh, we were super supportive of an organisation called Beyond Hand. Uh, this is a mobile phone app, which is um, revolutionising the way corporate volunteering can be delivered. Um, so thousands of people and a platform to kind of connect people um, to um, people who might be lonely, might be isolated, help them with shopping, etc. Um, and, you know, th that connectivity between volunteers um, and, and people who are actually lonely. So actually, we've seen a massive increase in people's digital connectivity um, through that scheme. And then equally, there's a scores now of possibilities for um, actually personalizing people's um, services, especially health services, in terms of uh, addressing prevention um, for, you know, through life health and well-being. And so another example of this was um, a, a, an organization called Breathe Happy, um, which actually delivers into people's living rooms um, physical exercise to help um, their, their mental health and well-being, often through yoga. And it's utilizing the latest AI and machine learning and data to give very tailored, personalized assessments back um, to, to users um, in order to help them understand um, how to strengthen joints and how to prevent damage. It's been hugely popular, but as these innovations grow, as, 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 as wonderful as they are, how are we going to ensure that these also reaches people perhaps in the greatest need? So a real service design and a real opportunity, but again, making sure that we can democratize healthy longevity to make sure that it is genuinely reaching um, the people most in need. So I think a quick whip through some of the, the key issues for us, this issue of through life inequality translating into digital inclusion is, is absolutely key, um, but also the, um, the ethics around this, making sure that we have a very transparent, open debate about both the possibilities, uh, but also some of the challenges. 
Um, but then, you know, the, the possibilities and actually the, the um, opportunity now to um, ensure that citizens are part of that debate in how their data is shared, equity of access, fewer people excluded, but how we can actually genuinely utilise data and digital connectivity uh, for genuine human progress is just um, so exciting. So it, it's a, an area that um, we intend to invest in to understand further and I'm very keen to kind of hear from other people on the call and see where we can further collaborate. Great. Thank you so much, Lynn. That was very interesting. Thank you. Yeah. And as, a, as an older person myself, I like to see that we're, we're represented here in this in this, this conversation. That's great. Okay, um, thank you. So let me hand over now to uh, Colin Watson. Are you there, Colin? Good afternoon. Um, yeah, I'm Colin Watson, undertaking a PhD at Newcastle University um, at Open Lab, um, just across the way from our colleagues at NICD. Um, so um, firstly, I wanted to just uh, talk briefly about e-government. Uh, e-government and digital exclusion are deeply intertwined. Uh, the delivery of policies by digital channels have to cater for service users being all citizens without limit, as Ben Carpenter uh, explained uh, uh, earlier. And citizens mostly don't have a choice of what system or channel to use. Sometimes they have little choice over digital versus non-digital. Uh, let's now consider my own area of interest, which is welfare benefits. These are not just for those in poverty or those who are disabled or those with long term health conditions or those who are classified as some other group. In the UK, at least, everyone will be eligible for some benefit at some point in their lives, say perhaps a state pension. Uh, value of, of these services is co-created during the, their use or consumption, demanding resources from all the parties involved. However, digital welfare benefit systems remain problematic for many citizens all of the time and for other, system, for other citizens some of the time. Uh, the most likely working age people who are internet non-users are those who are economically inactive, especially those adults on long-term sick leave or those who are disabled. Consequently, there's a, a large overlap between this group and those receiving income-related welfare benefits especially a digital first benefit like universal credit. Uh, we are all at risk of being poor. Some people find themselves uh, in this situation unexpectedly um, due to the pandemic last year and this year. Uh, despite this, poor people's behaviours are often incorrectly attributed to either the circumstances of their poverty or their personality traits. But we need to recognise that behaviours can also be a result of changes in how they interpret problems and make decisions. The more onerous using or consuming of services, the more people will need help, and this will also deter others from accessing their support entitlements. Digital welfare benefit systems and other e-government public services should avoid causing further harm. A well-documented harm is administrative burden, which is anything perceived onerous by a citizen that is imposed as a result of implementing a state policy. Administrative burdens are to individuals what compliance costs are to organisations. For citizens, the burdens include learning and preparing, the time taken and effort and costs expanded, sorry, expended through use and consumption, and the psychological costs, often in the form of stress or worry, frustration, fear or depression. The balance of these are different for each citizen, such that they find the same system more onerous or taxing than others. And this can vary day to day and as personal circumstances change. Furthermore, life problems deplete cognitive function, affecting attention and memory, which in turn can reduce capability to plan, make decisions, find and solve problems, focus attention, undertake new tasks, cope in challenging situations, even control impulses or overcome habitual responses. Cognitive depleting situations affect everyone, not just so-called vulnerable groups. For example, excessive mental load, fatigue and stress leading to reduced vigilance is a major cause of most aviation accidents. And being a pilot, navigator, technician, engineer or air traffic controller are not unskilled jobs. These people are using technology much of the time. So, Cognitive ability is limited. 
And for people in ordinary unstable situations, such as having to worry about their ability to pay their rent or feed themselves, their ability to undertake other tasks is reduced. And we need to recognize this. Both, bad, both debt and poverty are bad for mental health. And guess what are common attributes of people claiming welfare benefits? Yes, debt and poverty. Unemployment and unstable employment adversely affects individuals' health. And financial sanctions related to eligibility for benefit awards may also have short-term negative health effects. Furthermore, the stigma, the stigma of being poor has been found to diminish cognitive ability and suppress uptake of relevant support. The design of online welfare benefit systems and use of related data should therefore seek to minimize the cognitive effort and even reduce home life distractions in the, in the same way that having good childcare available and connected services can reduce worries. Cognitive limitations make it hard for people to gain and maintain employment, so reducing burdens will not only improve people's interactions with the service, but could also help improve people improve their employment situation. Other parties can also help reduce burdens. It can be too easy to think of a service with service user interactions as being a one-to-one -one relationship. In practice, people are not solitary agents, yet what services are designed to reflect this? Informal and formal sources of support are vital in helping citizens understand eligibility, gather documents and evidence, and make their claims. About a third of all claimants receive, of universal credit claimants receive some kind of help to make a benefits claim, many of whom rely on extra support to make these. And citizens on low incomes are increasingly relying on social support groups, especially during hard times and periods of crisis. These networks are dynamic, changing over time, reflecting the changeability of relationships, employment, family life and precarity. Leveraging data might be able to help reduce burdens. From interviews with universal credit claimants, apart from access to the internet, devices and data, people have been held back by missing information about rights, the service or system or about the case, slips and lapses or minor errors, including loss of information such as documents, lack of skills or knowledge, lags and delays, or reduced provision through lack of access or accessibility or complete unavailability. These increased cognitive load and consequential harms, therefore contributing to exclusion, and may even put off some people completely. Most of these on this list could be caused by any of the parties involved in the interaction. So for example, a service user may not understand what they need to provide, or equally, a civil servant may ask for the wrong thing. In summary, administrative burdens are transferred to service users. This is often at a time when people's capacity is reduced. They need the support of others, such as friends and family, neighbors, colleagues, and more formal sources of support. We need to consider what might remove mental load, including not assuming there is a single user, but instead designed for a wider ecosystem of support. That's incre increasing people's capacity to do other things, such as improving their lives. So, um, Efficiency should not really be the primary objective of technology for navigating life disruptions, such as is often the case in welfare benefits provision. And I think we should instead think more about cognitive load, digital exclusion, and how data can support people's own life experiences. So if I had to sum it up, I would say, if you're doing digital, make it simple, make it familiar, make it quick, and be accurate and consistent. So I encourage you to think of it of an aeroplane pilot dealing with an engine file fire while she was using your system. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Colin. You've actually saved us a minute or two. So I have got a question here for you from Adam Parnabe, which is related to just exactly what you were, you were summarizing there. So mm -hmm. he's, he says you, you mentioned the administrative burden associated with learning. How do you think our tendency to constantly tweak our designs impacts this? What's the administrative cost to the citizen of a UI overhaul? Yes, that's a, that, that, is, that is a good point. You're forcing users to um, reorientate and almost have to start again. It's, I think it depends a little bit also on the frequency of use of a service. So perhaps if it was something you only did once in your lifetime, it wouldn't matter. If it was something you did once a year, 
possibly not so problematic because you've probably forgotten what, what you did last year, but it's something you're using uh, fairly regularly or frequently. I think it's much, much, much more of an issue and you're forcing people um, to, to look for things, find things, and possibly feeling confused that they thought they knew how to do something, but now it's changed. Yeah. Yep, yep. I, mean, I do find that every time I go to the supermarket and they've moved something, I find exactly that problem. Okay, you uh, thank, you. Sorry. thank you very much, uh, Colin. And, and I will be asking you how you're doing that with your background shortly. Yep. Okay, uh, thank you. So let me hand over now to uh, Ragda. Ragda, are you there? Okay, uh, again, my name is Ragda, and I'm here to present you some work we have done, a group from the Open Lab led by uh, Prof uh, Dr. Ian uh, Smednik who left us, but uh, his work still is here. So I'm here uh, to present what we have done in terms of digital inclusion within the context of uh, learning health. So what happened uh, during my work on PhD at the Open Lab, we have been approached by the Learning Health Project, Professor Tom Foley, who is uh, leading on the Learning Health Project. And his main concern was how to build a learning health system simply. Uh, but mostly focused on a system that learns from every patient who's treated. And that's, that was like his main objective. And we together, me, uh, Tom, and another writer, we wrote a report, and uh, I will provide you with a link at the end of this uh, presentation. So uh, what is the context of our work was uh, that we know that healthcare, healthcare professionals and clinicians are first-line users. Uh, we can see that there are emerging self-assessment tools uh, that the patients are currently using to administer their uh, health. Uh, so the patients are becoming partners rather than users uh, and rather than somebody or like service, uh, uh, like providers are giving them a service, they're becoming also decision makers. So there is uh, some sort of a different re relationship emerging here, patients and cl uh, clinicians becoming partners and they are controlling data. So we can see that patients are becoming more in control of the data with the tools they are using to administer the health. Um, so we also consider that this, there, are, there are lots of socioeconomic uh, political aspects uh, that were prompting uh, digital divide. Beside the 10 uh, global ones we mentioned in these talks, uh, access, usability impact some of them. The most important aspect of uh, healthcare is complexity and uh, the variety of the patient's cases uh, and conditions uh, and also the variety of uh, services that can be provided and support them. So within this context, the processes that's happening and the data uh, that is uh, coming from these processes through the interaction uh, is producing some sort of knowledge. And technology uh, is thought to be a, a platform that can gather these uh, data to come up with something that we learn from uh, to be able to provide patients with better health. While this digital divide or uh, and socioeconomic divide standing on in the way, uh, so some digital inclusion considerations. Um, what we've done, we thought of a tester session for the learning health. Uh, we gathered around twenty collaborators uh, coming from. Um, a research background, academic, uh, software development uh, providers, uh, especially UX de designers, uh, healthcare professionals, and patients. So we tried to put them all together in a in a, a, a workshop, and that workshop used a co-design concept. But more than that, we are I'm today presenting a tool that can be used to overcome uh, digital exclusion uh, within this uh, context. So uh, there is a method that we developed called uh, method elicitation that I will introduce to you right now. Uh, our aim was to try to engage these participants because we know that whoever attended the session has been uh, in contact with the, with the lead of the uh, healthcare, uh, the learning health project, Tom, over five years. They have been speaking a lot about frameworks, elements, and what to do. Uh, and co-design came as a, as a tool that they can, they can use to develop a learning health. But uh, what we wanted to do is to give them a taster uh, of that uh, co-design uh, approach. And we wanted to engage them in something they do rather than talk about. Um, so we wanted to think uh, with them on their different uh, perspectives because they came from different backgrounds, uh, different requirements and concerns. 
so we we experimented a sample of uh, you know uh, most of the designers in this talk in, in, the, in the session know that we have like loads of design tools we cannot uh, do them in in, in, a, in a workshop the workshop was uh, spread over three hours well we had to select some design methods but also provide provide some resources which the participant can look at and, and decide whether these can be included as well so what we've done also uh, intersect with uh, with joining generally on a broad perspective the user and the professional experiences so it's not only about the human but also about the background of those here of those of those participants and there is a uh, like there is a field of experience based design particularly for the healthcare uh, and and some uh, of the scholars in this is glenn robert who came up with this perspective where you meet up with the patients you meet up with the professionals separately and try to understand deeply their experiences then you put them together and understand joint perspective and then focus on the priority and uh, focus on that that prioritize those experiences to to come up and design uh, systems that can support the healthcare process um, and then uh, eventually celebrate this by uh, starting to use these systems uh, what we've done is a bit different so we have, um, I wish I had more time to show you that platform. We have used uh, a, a structure that Jan came up with, which is a block structure. Uh, we use a, an introductory uh, block and a creative block and a wrap up block uh, or presentation block. Uh, so in, the, in those three blocks, we try to condense uh, and, and provide some tools that they become more of like guiding uh, tools because we were very constrained with time. Uh, again, we try to make sure that everybody collaborate and engages because this is what we wanted out of the co-design process. We want it to be uh, interactive. So we asked him to do stuff, not talk as well. Uh, so, and, and we had to put it on a virtual environment because this took place uh, when the COVID hit. So we use the co-design approach where, where, where the participants uh, and the co-design understand, ideate, design, uh, uh, decide and design and validate. But we use that as basis, but we haven't done actually co-design. It was just a taster of how co-design could be. So what we provided them uh, is seven steps where they gather in group as a community, they learn about each other, uh, and then they select some tools. And then we gave them like a mock tool, which uh, Young came up with uh, by designing something that could be a learning health system, but not mature uh, for to give them some idea of the end result. So application and design critique, like uh, with heuristic and best practices uh, evaluation. We also had a chunk where they have to think about their the ethical perspectives and reflect on the whole process. Is it doable? Can the patient be part? Can the clinician be part of it? Uh, and then we, we uh, move with them on another step where they uh, try to position what they, those tools they selected. In the application step, the third one, they try to apply the tools they selected on the first place on, on, on that application to critique it and to try to analyze and, and understand. But again, in the positioning step, they try to define what they actually want from these tools, which tools will be included, which tools should be excluded, and work more on these tools in depth, um, simply by like copying, pasting those tools on the space and, and try to fill in uh, content. Uh, and also the process, the planning process, okay, we have some de design tools, how do we use them? How long would it take us to produce something? Uh, what is the what are the stages? And then we ask the participant to pre to present what they have done. So uh, the process we we try to coin and and formalize uh, what we what is called a meta methodological iterative participatory process. Uh, the reason we wanted that is to, just to try to attune the co-design to more complex application context. So in that session, there, it's just a taster. And also we consider that this taster need to be done with the real groups where the, the patients and the physicians and the uh, designers, professionals all meet in one go uh, and then select the tools they would really need to use before they actually start using them in real life. So the idea 
identify the candidate methods, define the elicitation tasks, apply the, those taster methods, as I mentioned before, reflect on them, redefine again, and apply in depth. These steps, what we were hoping that could be useful as tools. The last uh, thing I wanted to talk is about the workshop outcomes. It was, it was amazing because all the stakeholders had different perspective and gathered. The, there was emphasis on inclusion a lot. They decided to customize their software, but also they customized the design method and it, uh, the session ascended their concerns. So these are the workshop facilitators. Um, and uh, these are some links that could help you to go to the uh, Learning Health Project and Open Lab to learn more about this tool. Thank you. Thank you very much, Raghav. That was excellent, very good. Uh, okay, last uh, of our speakers is uh, Stephen Bacon from Vodafone. Stephen, are you there? I can see you all. I am. Maybe. I'm hoping my uh, audio is a little bit better now, switch to a headset. It's not, it's not great, it has to be said, Stephen, but let's try it anyway. Um, over to you. Plan. Blame them off our network. <laughs> okay, um, so yes, I just wanted to um, talk a little bit about what Vodafone has done um, during the pandemic and what we're planning to do moving forward. Um, I'm assuming Vodafone won't need any introduction, but just in case, we're one of the largest telcos in the world. So we operate over hundreds of different countries, um, one of the largest IoT organizations in the world, and we actually carry 20% of the world's internet traffic, which is a nice little statistic. Um, let me just share my screen and I'll run through some of the things that we've done. This is just some of the stuff that we did uh, last year and uh, some of the stuff that we, we are continuing to this year as well. So one of the programs was Schools Connected. So um, more often than not, large corporates tend to just try and throw money at problems and, and take a headline. Um, and I'm sure both want to be responsible for that in the past. But what we wanted to do is make sure that connectivity that we could provide free of charge got into to the right people's hands. Um, we chose to, to actually use a distribution partner and have schools apply for connectivity. And we thought that with that little filter where the schools were, were actually handing out to, to pupils that, that may have been digitally excluded uh, during uh, lockdown when they were forced to work from home, um, then they would at least be a bit of a sense check and it wouldn't be a free for all. So uh, interesting statistics that, that, that came back. We, we actually only initially pledged in 200,000 SIM cards and they, they were all taken up in a week and a half. So we put another 150,000 on top. So 350,000 SIMs were distributed and there's a little bit of a, a geographical split there. The Northeast of Yorkshire took 57,750 SIMs. And that really was uh, an eye opener for, for Vodafone as an organization. And um, they really identified that there was a, a stark problem that needed addressing. Um, some of the other things we did with the Great British Tech Appeal uh, we, we managed to, to gather lots of um, devices, uh, recycle them and distribute them out again using a, a charity partner, Bernardo's this time, to make sure that they got to the people that needed them. And uh, a few of the talks mentioned um, actually upskilling and giving people the right skills within that digital environment. One of the things that's uh, really nice that we do is a digital parenting guide. And we, um, we, we send out free of charge as PDF or you can get it. It's uh, actually free of charge to send to you in physical copy as well. What this does is allow parents to pick up digital skills, to help keep their children safe online, helps them to keep up with the latest trends so the people that, uh, that, you know, that, that are not as, as in touch with technology and know what to look out for and help keep their, their, their people safe online. Within the NHS, it was a big above the line campaign. We, we obviously give out free of charge data. Um, one of my roles with, with Vodafone is to look after NHS accounts and local government. We're looking at um, doing something alongside a, a large trust where we are using our retail estate and um, uh, inviting people in that, that have been recommended by the trust to come along. And we are going to give them some digital skills to help them do remote appointments, remote consultancies. So we can uh, not only try to give them technology, connectivity, we're also trying to upskill as well. We also did a couple of nice things with um, within care homes using our network of, of contacts and, and customers um, that, that are care providers. We did a sing along with Catherine Jenkins. Um, we've also zero rated data to get into some some you know certain places where, where you've got e-learnings and, and courses and making that free of charge so that anyone can get access to it as long as they've got that connectivity. So what we're doing moving forward. So there's lots of um, there's, there's lots of stuff that um, we're, we're looking to do in the coming year. So we put a pledge, a big pledge on the table. It's um, we're going to try and connect another million people by the end of 2022. 
and that is via various different me methods. And um, one, one of the partners that we're using is the Trussell Trust, who are operating food banks. So where we get, um, we're going to give them connectivity, and they all distribute to the people that need it. We're also looking to um, launch a program which is charities.connected, where any charity that's registered can actually apply for connectivity for, for any project that they want to do. Um, again, we're looking at really enhancing digital skills, uh, making sure that, that we, we're holding sessions in, in local areas. And you know, it really stacks this exam. 5.3 million people have not been online in the last three months. Uh, and Vodafone really want to do what, what we can. And, uh, you know, sessions like this will really get insight and um, you know, the thinking and, and some of the, the, the problems that we may not actually know uh, or, or some of the thoughts that we've not really considered. So uh, all, all, all of the stuff that I've heard today, I'll be taking back to our corporate social responsibility teams um, just to see if they've thought about some of the, some of the points, the really great things that, uh, that have been brought up. That's all from me. I am um, no, happy to I'm taking questions. Hopefully you, you, you could hear me. Just a question for you, Stephen, then. So this number, 5.3 million, have not been online. What, what does that represent? Is that, uh, what do you mean, 5 million? Do you mean, well, that doesn't include babies, for example, or what's the, what, is that of the people who are of adult age or whatever? How, how, do, you, how do you break that down? So I, I, I need to go into the, to, to the numbers. It's from ONS. So um, the, I, I didn't put this slide together myself. So I'd, I'd um, more than happy to, to come back to you with what, what was quantified in that, in that figure. Be, that number would be interesting. It would be interesting to know mm -hmm. how that number was created and also how, what's it constituted? Who, who are those people? Do they have any sense of who those people are? What demographic they're from or age group or whatever? That would be really interesting to know. Yeah, yeah I'll see what's your big out in terms of that, you know, the, the next level of data on that one. Great. Okay, well, thank you very much, Stephen. That was very interesting. No problem. So thank you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, so if you have any any questions, please do put them in the chat. We had we had one earlier, which I, which I raised. Most of the comments are congratulating us on, on good talks. Um, but I've, I've got a couple of questions then for the moment, just to, and if anybody else wants to raise them, we'll, we'll open things up after my questions and people can just come in and, and, and talk. One of, the issues, one of the things that we seem to have covered quite a lot are a number of speakers mentioned, and Adam kicked it off right at the start, by saying that digital exclusion, exclusion is social exclusion. And a couple of speakers touched upon that point, you know, are just generally to our speakers and anybody else who wants to comment, are we wasting our time focusing on digital exclusion or, or you know, should we focus all of our energy on social exclusion and digital access to services is just one particular way that we can improve upon social exclusion? And maybe Adam, just to kick off because you, you raised the, the subject in the first place. Yeah, sure. Um, so. Yes and no. Um, I, uh, to, to a degree, I think that focusing on digital exclusion with blinkers on with regard to social exclusion can often be a waste of time. That's where we get a lot of these kind of um, what, I, what I might call uh, kind of very techno optimistic approaches that just result in kind of dumping as much technology as possible into a deprived area and hoping that the problem goes away. A sort of build it and they shall come approach. Um, really, I think the approach does need to be more holistic than that. And it is, um, so for example, in, uh, in NTCA, digital inclusion is being considered alongside the inclusive economy more broadly. And I think that more holistic approach where digital inclusion sits within inclusion more broadly is um, a productive way to go about it. Okay, thank you. Uh, so any other speakers comment on that? So Lynn, for example, uh, does the same thing apply for, yeah. the, for the older population? Yeah, I think I think it's um, it, it, they are intri intrinsically linked, and so I think by addressing social inclusion, you know, as Adam sort of eloquently said, you, you do address kind of many many of the issues. But uh, that, my plea was for more sophistication because um, even people who are very wealthy, very digitally connected, can still experience barriers, especially around the ethics that you know are raised in terms of, for example, data sharing with um, different companies, etc. So there is a need to kind of raise the level of debate. Totally agree with Adam. It is ridiculous that in the UK in the 21st century we have people who are not connected and 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 we have to address that that is a massive issue um, rural urban exclusion etc um, but you know there is that need for that kind of much more sophisticated debate about the different types of exclusion and people can be excluded in different ways across the life course it's a skills agenda and so on and so forth so 
Ragda, you have a comment with it with an interesting different I think the focus should be more on the inclusion rather than the exclusion, but definitely the talks about exclusion will be focus to think about what can be done. Uh, the tools, the processes, the methods, uh, technology is, is becoming more and more prevalent and uh, we cannot uh, disregard the digital divide, definitely, but how can we include people, what are the tools and, and methods and the leaders, uh, in government leaders, coming to them later, later is, is what we need to uh, get them involved. So leaders are very important to be involved in this process. We can talk endlessly about what we want to do, but unless we have sponsorship and support, it's not going to happen. Um, thanks for your comment. Uh, okay, Ben? And I, I just wanted to make the point, I think it's a really, I think this is a, for me, on, in, on inclusion, this is a fundamental question. And of what, um, did you, did you, what, like, why measure did it, digital exclusion? What are you really measuring? Is it digital inclusion for digital inclusion's sake? I mean, it's, it's a so what question. So is it, what are the outcomes you really want to get by getting people online? Is it more customers? Is it more money for your business? Is it uh, better social outcomes? So I, th I, I always wish, and, and having worked in assisted digital within government design where the obsession becomes, let's just measure the number of people who are getting on, using our service online, not how, what are the outcomes for all of the users of the service. Uh, it's a very dangerous um, thing to start becoming fo over-focused on uh, onlineness, for onlineness's sake. I'd rather people were meeting to get your outcomes. Was, I'd rather people were using really well designed phone lines and meet and getting lovely paper forms through the door and people coming around to help them fill them out than they were just online. Yeah. So presumably part of digital exclusion is economic exclusion, right? It's because the, the providers, there, there are communities they don't care that much about because they don't think they can make much money from them, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah, there's loads, there as we discussed, there are loads of sort of um ripple effect things of being excluded from something yeah but it's what the effects are that we should worry about and yeah financial exclusion um employment exclusion uh social exclusion uh, but in some ways it might be really good for people as well so you, you don't necessarily just want to say the way to the best way to be is online it has to be an option some people will say i get i get very stressed out on endless zoom calls i want to have face-to-face -face meetings what do we say to them you know if you have to have a hard conversation with someone who's suffering a bereavement about a will or inheritance tax, do you really want to say, fill out this 30 page online form or do you want to meet them? Um, so yeah. Um, Lynn? Yeah, I would agree with that um, completely, Ben. I think it's about kind of, you know, utilising um, data, utilising digital, whether it's online or not, in terms of, you know, opening up opportunities for people, giving people choice. And, um, and that's what's important. And then if you flip it around in terms of some of the stuff that Steve was talking about in terms of uh, products and services that we are designing, we are, certainly we're working with North of Tyne um, in this area. It's about the opportunity. If we don't connect people, we're missing the opportunity to harness all of their incredible experience, their ideas, their knowledge, and actually channel that towards better services, better product design, um, and, and so on. So actually, as, as well as kind of all the inclusion issues, which are just so important, it's just a massive missed opportunity of all of that human capital. Yeah, I mean, hopefully, hopefully, as a community, we can we can do, we can contribute <laughs> by, by looking at service design. But um, so from uh, Mark, from your perspective, and um, so the sort of community that you're running and engaging with, We've got a, a large community of data professionals up here. What's what's the number one thing that we can do um, to assist? I mean, is it a matter of engaging more with school kids or what would you recommend that a community like ours could do to assist? If you're still there, Mark. No, I think we may have lost, we may have lost Mark. Um, okay. See? Can I, can I comment on this? Uh, yes, Steve? please do. There's, a, there's an approach right now uh, called uh, universal design. Uh, so, and also where you're including just everybody, especially when you're providing a service like government services or a service that is open to public. Uh, so universal design, trying to focus on the generics and not the specific, and then maybe develop that la later to personalize, to make it more usable. Uh, but uh, like the global community uh, is becoming more and more uh, like smaller with the, with the, with the use of uh, those tools of communication. The, I think the power of the participants is, is, is important here. If they, if they lose their competence, they may not participate. So we need to empower the, the, the potential participants 
uh, the messages relate to them that it's not to, to, to fear participating uh, and, and, and try to uh, have a voice. Uh, and uh, especially when, to, when talking about software design or when talking about serv services, uh, it might intimidate them and make them feel uncomfortable that there is uh, outside the scope of their knowledge. So, so Roger, when you talk about universal design, are you, are you talking about standardization? You know, is, there, is, is that what we're talking about? Are we talking about GDS or something defining some standard format that everybody knows and then you have variants on that? Is that the sort of thing? Pretty much saying? close to this, but uh, focus on the generics mainly and then specify because there are spaces where everybody gather and then you go specify to specific to, to the user's needs to make, make it more applicable to them and personalized to their needs. And Ben, do you know whether are there are there efforts under underway to try to create those sort of that sort of level of standardization? Well, I work on the service standard uh, team okay. and service <laughs> and the manual that supports it. So that's the central uh, standard for digital services. But it's just called service. So we just call them services now. Not try not but to say it, digital. Is that a standard interface, or is it just a set of rules of things you should do? Yeah, it's. Um, not principles, yeah, things you must do. So service, services that go live on gov.uk have to wow. meet the service standard. But it's not so a standard sort of look and feel that people would expect to see on all sites. Yeah, no, yeah, so it, include, so it okay. includes it includes that there'll be, so to meet the service standard, you have to show how the, the look and feel of your online stuff is in keeping with the design system and uh, okay. other guidance. So. Very good, very good. Okay, does anybody else have any questions or, or comments? Coming up to the end of time anyway, but anybody got any questions? Please just speak. Either you, oh sorry, yes, Colin. It's you've got a you've got a multicolored background behind you there, so I can barely <laughs> see that hand up. Okay, sorry, <laughs> you're coming. Uh, yes, I, I would just ask if the question was about uh, what can the data community do. I would say, uh, what what can the data do to help the people, the citizens, the service users meet their goals rather than meeting the goals of the public sector organization. Okay, great, thank you, thank you. A comment from, from Adam there. Um, conversations moved on, but something else hap that happens when you try to do digital inclusion without considering social factors and ethics is that you measure and target people using specific products. Are you digitally excluded if all you can do is use Google's products and therefore must give them your data? So what's, what's wh let's try you first, Adam. What's your answer to your own question? Uh, well, uh, so what I'm uh, trying to to get at here, and this is this is building on uh, something that um, Ben was saying about what what is the actual end goal here. Um, we uh, we often find that um, in in the kind of the various uh, skill surveys that I'm talking about, the thing that naturally happens is that people want to measure. Um, access to uh, key services that people need to use. In employment, that tends to mean, can you use office software? Office software tends to mean, say, Microsoft products or Google products. Um, but that means that when that gets into the data early on, you end up with this whole ecosystem of measurements and targets and interventions that is only teaching people how to use software from one of two companies, rather than teaching people how to, say, make an informed choice about what they want to use, uh, maybe in a resource-constrained environment open source, uh, targeting open source uh, products would be better because it means that a community center isn't having to pay for however many uh, Office 365 subscriptions. Um, and that that kind of uh, criticality in what we're actually aiming for is something that I would, um, I'm, I'm very encouraged by the conversations that are happening around that. Um, and I would very much like to uh, encourage more of that. I would argue. <laughs> There's a perspective of uh, like using those pre, uh, like paid software and the, the freeware or the open source software uh, is the maturity level and the service, especially in large organizations where you always need support. And these open source, they always, they're definitely they're under development, ongoing development, and they're being hardened, but they are lacking on the service support. The user has to learn them, themselves to go to those portals, organizations where these are supported and learn themselves how to use these tools and how to maintain, uh, especially in, in terms of processes. So the uh, paid software would always uh, win in terms of support and, and, and competence user. So you cannot give the user the, uh, the uh, like, 
you cannot give users software without, without teaching them how to use it and supporting them because their competence is uh, is underpinned by the, the, by the, the autonomy. So you, 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 you have to give them first the knowledge and then leave them to do whatever you expect them from the technology. Right, thank you, Magda. Um, anybody else have comments on that, Sergeant? Um, I, I would just say in response to that, that that's um, that's a, a good point, and I totally agree with the with the uh, central point there that you can't give someone the the product without giving them the support. Um, but I would question whether the only way to get that support is through a uh, corporate paid service model, or whether there are other interventions that could be done that would plug those gaps. And I agree that those interventions aren't being done at the moment. Um, so for the time being, there's definitely um, an argument in favor of the approach that you're advocating. Okay. Great. Okay, does anybody else have any other comments? Okay, well, so at this point, let me thank, uh, wow, Zach has just put a very long point into the, <laughs> into the, into the chat. I think I'll, I'll copy that and try to answer that later. No, thanks, Zach. Um, okay, so thank you very much, everybody. Um, very interesting uh, topics or conversation, very interesting uh, talks. Uh, we'll probably follow up with all of you uh, to get you engaged in future events and hopefully get you to engage with the, with the community again. So uh, thank you again. See you perhaps at the next event, which will, I think we're taking a break for August, so it'll probably be in September. Okay, thank you everyone.